Welcome to another lecture. I hope my lectures are providing some sort of value in your career. Let's now look at the most important topic of this section, stress strain relationships in structural steel. An engineer must be familiar with the property of steel to better understand the behavior of the structure. One such property is the relationship between the stress and strain for steel. I am assuming you are aware of what stress and strain mean from your structural mechanics class. The stress strain relationship will provide us with the valuable information as to how the steel will behave in a given situation. Let's now dig deep into this. Let's have a look at the diagram to your right. It's called a stress strain diagram. As you can see, there is strain plotted on the horizontal axis and stress plotted on the vertical axis. The graph here explains the behavior of steel in tension. Let's have a look at one particular section here. I have named it as section A, highlighted in red. The first key observation you would do here is that it's a straight line. What does that say? It says that stress and strain are in linear proportion, which is the very basis of Hooke's law. So it's safe to say that steel obeys Hooke's law in region A of the diagram. Now let's visualize Hooke's law. Imagine a tensile stress of about 6000 PSI is applied to the steel rod and it, and it elongates to a certain amount. What would happen if you double the stress? It's obvious that the elongation will, would double too, right? That's Hooke's law. The steel in region A behaves elastically. It means that if stress is released, the object would come back to its original position with no permanent deformation. So you can say that steel is in its elastic range when obeying Hooke's law. Hooke's law is only obeyed until a certain point. The point on the diagram to which Hooke's law is obeyed is called its proportional limit. It is also sometimes called proportional elastic limit because the steel stops behaving elastically uh, from this point onwards. The strain at the proportional limit, the x ordinate in the diagram, is called the elastic strain. Let's now look at the second phase of the stress strain diagram. We'll name it as B. Here, as you can notice, the stress and strain are not linear. So, it does not obey Hooke's law. This also means that the material is no longer elastic. It has entered what we call a plastic zone. There is one more key observation we can make from the graph. That there is a large amount of strain for a very small increase in stress. As the graph is almost horizontal, the y ordinate or the stress value does not change appreciably, but the x ordinate or the strain value increases by a large number. The stress at which there is a significant increase in strain without any increase in stress is called its yield stress. On the diagram, it's the point where the tangent of the curve is horizontal. I hope it's clear up to this point. If not, you can always leave a comment, I'll be happy to help. Yield stress is one of the most important terms for a structural engineer. The stress induced on the structure at any point should never increase the yield stress. The total strain in the steel region, uh, sorry, the total strain in steel in region B of the diagram is called the plastic strain. If we remove the loading from the object, it would never come back to its original position. And the deformation would be permanent or plastic. Region B can also be used as an advantage to the designer. Let me explain how. In case there is an overloading in the structure beyond its yield stress, as we know, there will be a considerable increase in strain in the structure, uh, structure but there will be no increase in stress. Thanks to its tactile behavior of steel, it will not fail prematurely as there is no increase in stress in the, in, uh, in the structure. Let's now have a look at the third and the last phase of the stress strain diagram. I have named it as C. So following the plastic strain, 
there is a range in which additional stress is necessary to produce additional strain. This is called strain hardening. This portion of the diagram is not very important to a designer because of large deformation occurring up to this phase. The diagram you see on your right is just a small part of the actual stress strain curve. Please note that this diagram is not to scale. I will show you the exact uh, actual stress strain diagram now. Let's now look at the scaled stress strain diagram. The previous diagram that we looked at was just a small part of this curve as highlighted in blue. The total strain at failure is about 150 to 200 times the elastic strain. The curve will actually continue up to its maximum stress value and then tail off before fracture. The cross section of the member sharply decreases, also called necking as discussed before, happens just before the member fails. Let us now discuss the upper and lower yield points. You might have seen these words in the previous slides, but must be wondering what that is. The stress strain relationship curve obtained previously can be changed based on the speed of loading, temperature and steel type. Let's understand the speed of loading in this slide. If the load or stress applied on the steel is rapid, that is a high rate of loading, the curve will follow the dotted line as shown. The yield stress obtained from this type of loading is called the upper yield. Similarly, if the load is gradually applied on the steel, that is a low rate of loading, the curve will follow the solid line as shown. And the yield stress obtained from this type of loading is called the lower yield. I hope it's more clear now. Let us now look at the effect of temperature on structural steel. The graph to your right tells us the variation of yield stress of steel with respect to change in temperature. Each line represents a material. We are interested in structural steel, which is the green line. The curve starts at room temperature, where the strength is at 100%. As you can see, the yield stress initially increases with increase in temperature up to approximately 700 Fahrenheit. If we try to raise the temperature further, say 800 to 1200 Fahrenheit, there is a significant reduction of yield stress in steel. And there is very little strength in steel left at 1200 Fahrenheit temperature, as you can see from the graph. These temperatures can easily be reached in an, in, in an event of fire or also during welding procedures. This in detail explains the disadvantage of steel regarding fire as we had discussed earlier. Till here, we discuss what happens to steel at high temperatures. But if we test the steel at lower temperatures, say 32 degree Fahrenheit or at 0 degree Celsius, the tensile, strength, the tensile strength of the steel will increase a little, but it will start losing its ductility and toughness. The steel becomes more brittle at lower temperatures. So that's it for this lecture. We now have a deep understanding about the behavior of steel in tension. See you in the next lecture.